Hello, uh, we will discuss graphs today, a very important data stru structure in computer science. Uh, so it is basically a set of vertices and edges and as definition as simple as that uh, will uh, help us model many problems in computer science. It is pretty impressive. Uh, so a Facebook network, a social network for instance, uh, can be modeled as a graph where every vertex circles here are uh, members are uh, human beings uh, and there are there is an edge between two vertices if those two uh, people are uh, friends basically so uh, this is how we can organize our data with only vertices and edges or footballers are connected by edges uh, footballs are connected if they ever if they have ever played at the same team anytime in their careers uh, so for instance this can be Zinedine Zidane and this can be Roberta Carlos because they have played at the same team at some point so uh, I can model that as well formally uh, I have a, have a set of vertices V and set of edges E uh, by the way there is an alternative term for vertices which is nodes but uh, I will stick with the vertices here edges can be directed meaning that uh, the order here matters the edge from is from V to W in, in the directed case uh, but uh, uh, an, a graph without any uh, direct directed edges is called undirected graph and it is the default graph so when I say graph you should uh, understand that sorry about that uh, yeah so two vertices are adjacent if they are uh, connected by an edge uh, as the definition implies uh, a path between two vertices is a sequence of edges that begins at one vertex and, and, and ends at the other vertex so uh, a path from VI to VJ can be composed of these edges. It's a simple path if I see the vertex name only once, at most once. So there will be no duplicates. Uh, and a cycle is a path that begins and ends at the same vertex, and a simple cycle is the same, except I will not use the other vertices uh, more than once. So let's visualize these uh, ideas. Uh, here, in this case, one is adjacent to two because of this edge. And so is one and four, etc. Uh, a path here is from. So let's also draw it. From one to five, it's a set of two edges, one and two. A path from one to five. A cycle here is a cycle one, three, four, one. It is a cycle of three three cycle we call it n cycle if it consists of n edges uh, so this is a simple cycle because i haven't used three or five for more than once but it is also a cycle one three four one four one kind of weird but it is okay it is not a simple cycle though it is just a, a cycle uh, similarly we had this one, two, five path that I have already discussed. A graph is connected if there is a path between every pair of vertices, and it is complete if there is an edge between every pair of vertices. So there is a difference here. So this is a connected graph because I can go from one vertex to any other vertex, and this holds for all vertices. So I can go from here to here. But this is not connected because I cannot go from here to here or here. This is not complete though because I am missing this edge, right? But this is complete because I have all the edges. So if I have n vertices, I have I will have n choose two number of edges because I need to select all the pairs and put an edge in between them. Directed graph uh, is the one that has directed edges. Then I have this successor predecessor. Uh, information coming so in particular for this edge v to w from v to w w is the successor of v and v is the predecessor of w uh, 
directed path is same ex as the normal path except I have a directed edge set, not normal edge set. Uh, a cycle in a directed graph is also possible, uh, but again, now I need to use directed edges. So it will start and end at the same vertex. A graph, a directed graph without any cycle is called a dog directed acyclic graph. It will be very useful, as you will see later. Uh, an undirected graph is connected if there is a path from every vertex to every other. Yeah, so we have discussed this uh, before. I, I repeat it here because a directed graph with such a property is called strongly connected. Okay, so there will be a path between every pair of vertices. Even if I have a directed graph, then I will have a strongly connected graph. So this is one such a graph, I guess, because there is a path. It's a directed graph because of the directions here. Uh, there is a path from one to everywhere else, similarly from two to everywhere else, and so this is strongly connected. But what if this direction, this edge, was like this? So it goes from one to three. Then be careful. There is no path from two to three, right? I I cannot. Uh, actually, it was not strongly connected to begin with. Sorry, because uh, because of this situation. So don't uh, look at this uh, drawing. So let's keep the original edge, which is this one. So this is not a strongly connected directed graph because. There is no path from 2 to 4, right? I can go from 2 to 5, and then I am stuck. From 5 to 4, there is no path. So it is not strongly connected. However, there may be a component that is strongly connected, like this one, this cycle. Now there is a path from 3 to 4, there is a path from 1 to 4, from 4 to 3, 4 to 1, etc. So this is strongly connected component, SCC. Of this graph what is weakly connected then uh, a graph disregard the directions so consider these edges as normal edges without any directions is it connected yeah it is connected now I can go from 2 to 4 two, because there is no direction 2 to 5 and 5 to 4 so this version is connected then I call this directed graph weakly connected directed graph. That's that. So it is the uh, same example, just like adjacency. Two is adjacent to one because uh, uh, one connects to two, uh, etc. We also have weights in graphs. Uh, so on these edges, I can associate each edge with, with a real number, or with with a integer, rather with a real number. It's Covers integers as well. So, uh, weighted graph then, and undirected graph and weighted directed graph. So, these ways will be useful, for instance, to solve shortest paths problem. How do I implement a graph using a matrix, using adjacency matrix or adjacency list? Each one has its own advantages and disadvantages, so there will be trade offs. Uh, Adjacency matrix is this. Uh, we will, if I have n vertices, then I will have an n by n matrix where uh, the entry ij is one if there is an edge from vertex i to vertex k. So yeah, I have a, a graph. So w to one, there is an edge. So I need to put a one at vertex at row y and column w. Yes, so there is a one. That is the whole idea actually. P to R, so T vertex P and vertex R is this. But there is no, this is a directed graph, be careful. Uh, there is no edge from R to P, so R versus P, this is zero. Similarly, there is no edge from P to Z, so P to Z, this is zero. It is the idea. Uh, so space requirement is terrible actually. Uh, you have V vertices, then you have a matrix v by v matrix so i need v square space 
this is acceptable if graph is dense because then uh, there is information there are many edges so there are many non-zero values it is okay but if the graph is sparse like the graphs we use in computer graphics by the way so every 3d model is composed of set of vertices and edges there is also an additional face component there but currently don't see the coloring just focus on the edges and the vertices this is sparse because take a vertex like this guy it is connected to one two three four five six other vertices but i have maybe 200 vertices overall only six so i have a small number of connections only around the neighborhood so this is one example of a sparse graph this is a complete graph it is dense because actually it is the densest you can get because for every pair of vertices you have an edge and choose to or in this case i am using the letter v i guess so we we choose to it is what if you recall the combinatorial series v times v minus one uh, over two so it is always square big always square uh, so anyway let's come back to it is a matrix uh, it is good uh, so as far as time complexity goes it is good to determine whether there is an edge from i to j that query because for that just look at that entry in constant time o1 this is an o1 operation so is there an edge from i don't know s to y just look at this entry s y if it is zero then you say no it is bad to find all vertices uh, so not that bad but relatively bad and in the other adjacent list is probably better to find all vertices adjacent to a given vertex i you need to for instance for x you need to go through all the elements in this row and print the ones that when you hit a one so let's talk about why go through all these n elements so it is it has the cost of o n uh, 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 and you will print r and z in this case so let's double click r and say z and r and the weighted graphs can also be supported easily so if this is there is a weight 8 then instead of putting number 1 where is that y to r this is, instead of putting number 1 just put number 8 or the value of the weight here and in this case since weights can be 0 for no edge condition you just put infinity instead of 0 mm. This is the case of so B and C is connected, so I have B, C, 9. And so notice that if this is an undirected graph, it is also symmetric. The matrix is symmetric because the connectivity, the friendship is two sided. There is no platonic situation here. Adjacency list uh, is a different uh, implementation of a graph so let's again go to an example in this case space requirement is all ev v because for every vertex so you keep an array and of size v and then you start link lists uh, from each slot here so for instance for node w since it is uh, connected to s and y so start a link list having values s and y okay that is the idea t for p it should be w and r yes. order doesn't really matter uh, and yeah. so for x there is no neighbor of f x it is not connected because of the directions so it is an, an empty link list so it is easy to see that space requirement is all e v because v is because of this array and e is the number of edges means uh, the number of connectivities so all the nodes here are due to the edges so e plus v now in this case it is not so efficient to determine whether there is an edge from i to j 
because to understand that come to vertex i which is t in this case and look at the link list here and try to see whether j is here or not so this operation is now o n but remember when i was using an adjacency matrix that operation was o1 because i just look at that index and if it is one i say yes if it is zero i say false but the good thing is uh, the efficient thing is about finding all vertices adjacent to a given vertex so come to that slot and print every item in this link list so there can still be n items but uh, it is the information you really need to deal with so there is nothing you can do it is the best but with the adjacency metrics for instance to get to neighbors of w you process all these zeros as well in vain it is just uh, you have to touch them but here you don't touch them so that is that um, and uh, okay if the graph is weighted with these linked list nodes you can also keep the weights right it is not a big problem but it's same idea. now let's compare them in one slide and summary so we have seen that determine whether there is an edge from i to j can be solved fastly with matrix and poorly with linked list uh, Finding all vertices adjacent to your vertex i can be solved fastly with a list, adjacency list, but not with the adjacency matrix. For the space requirement, adjacency matrix is always square. You really need to reserve that many slots, even if most of them are going to be zero, in especially this sparse case, so then it is not recommended. Uh, Against this list has this optimal uh, cost, which is fine. So, if the matrix is dense, if you have many edge information, then it's okay to go with the adjacency matrix information if the graph is dense uh, because you have that information anyway. And if you go with matrix, then you will solve this uh, problem very quickly in constant time. And adjacency list is better if graph is sparse as we have seen. Now let's warm up with nice theorems. Uh, it sounds weird at the first glance, but it is very cool in my opinion. Let A be the edges matrix of graph of a graph. So for this graph, it would be it, right? So I go in alphabetical order. So A, B, C, D, mm. and the same goes for the column A, B, C, D. Uh, so there is an edge from A to B, I have one, etc. Now the interesting part is this. The kth power of the adjacency matrix, take the kth power of the adjacency matrix, look at the i kth entry, it will give you the heads of length k from the i to vk. So, very interesting. So let's prove it. So in, before that, let's let this sink down. Uh, so when power is 1, I am dealing with the regular edges matrix. Number of paths of length 1, meaning that edge, right? Path of length 1 means an edge. So A and B, there is an edge, so I have 1. There is only one edge, which is normal. From, I don't know, this is row B. D to B, there is no edge, so 0 and 3. But B to C, there is an edge, so 1. This is okay. Square means I will be looking at paths from uh, of size to square means paths of size to so let's look at here the resulting result is this so from A to A I have two such paths let's see them it is this right A B B A is one and A B B A is two uh, Similarly, A to C, I have two pets. What is this? The first one, A to B, B to C, pet one. And the other is A to B, B to C, pet two. So I have really two pets. How about A cube? And then I am looking for pets of length three. So let's look at this entry. There is no pets of length three from A to A. So it's true because pet one, pet two, then 
them to then I can't go back to A. But from A to B there are four paths. Let's count them. One, two, three. So this is pet one. One, two, three, this is pet two. One, two, three, this is pet three. And what else? This I think one, two, three. Four. So this is two. So I believe it is clear. Now let's prove it. How the hell is this a holding? Proof by induction. It's a very nice case of induction here. Uh, so, basic basis step. Uh, when k is one, it is the edges matrix with uh, n equals to ed edges of we have heads of length one, so it is clear. Uh, so even k one should be enough for me. But it can also be verified for K2, it is not very clear. This real part is this. So what is happening here? Uh, the, this is a K minus 1 I am is the number of paths of length K minus 1 from VI to VM. Okay. This is uh, since it is a smaller case. I need to believe in the induct induction hypothesis. So, if I have V i, if I want to compute the number of paths of length k from V i to V j, so I know that from induction, this scalar value will give me the number of paths from V i to V m. So that's what we have here. So this is one path. Maybe this is another path. Then we see the other path, two paths, in this case, it is three. Value is three in this case. Uh, now, be careful, I multiply it with this. What is AMG? It is the number of paths of length one, because I have exponent one here. From M to J. In other words, I am looking for an edge from M to J. So, if there is an edge from M to J, then it connects the connection, it completes the connection from VI to VJ come with this weird path to VM and then use your edge so count this uh, then it becomes one so this is counted towards the paths from VI to VJ of size K that is the idea too if there is no uh, edge from VM to VJ then this would be zero so whatever you count here it really doesn't count because I will multiply it with zero the idea. Let's go on. Graph traverses. How do I explore a given graph? There are uh, two main methods, BFS and BFS. So I'm going to start with Red first search, where I visit uh, vertex bread by red. What I mean is, first do this frontier, then from this do this, then this, then this, and then this. So these are the order times. Visit types, visiting types. So let's also go through this uh, example. At time one, I am here. Then I will visit the vertices in this order, in this frontier, and this frontier, and this frontier. So, but how do I implement this? Then it will be more clear. I will use a queue that we have seen before. So it's a good application of a queue. A FIFO, a regular first in first out queue. So, to achieve this, uh, basically from A, start with a random point A, uh, put it to your queue. So, this is the queue from front to back. Okay. The queue it, so it is gone, empty. And then enqueue the neighbors in any order. So, in this case, I enqueue B, then F, then I. Because these are my neighbors, so the F I am at this line. Then do the same. FIFO. So first thing was uh, B. So remove the Q from the beginning. So B is gone. But when I move B out of my life, I add the neighbors of B, unvisited neighbors. A is processed, I don't do it, but C and D, I enqueue them. So when B goes away, 
C comes and E comes. I have this situation. Let me continue. Remove F. The QF. Uh, and U to F. Insert or NQ. It is the only arms that work next. Then I'm, F is gone. It is welcome. Then I is gone. The Q it. it uh, and Q nothing because all the neighbors are visited. I is gone. Then C is gone. I'm here. And because of C, at the neighbor of C, which is B, I'm here. Then E is gone. Uh, and because of E, add nothing. T is gone because of T, add nothing. D is gone. Remove D. And because of T, add 8. And after 8, remove it and add nothing. Because no, there is no unvisited sky. So what happened is, I start from here. I first visited this, this frontier. And then this frontier. And then what happened this frontier. Uh, this and then this. So if you implement this, uh, we start with the first vertex in our queue. So as the queue, so mark it as visited, as the queue is uh, not empty, remove it from the queue. Uh, then, so Every vertex will go into your queue, so this will take all the time. And okay, I will touch every vertex once. And for a given vertex, I look at my neighbors and uh, enqueue them if they are not visited. So this is this block is a small activity, not it is not touching all e vertices, but when you look at it in total, uh, when you look at this when you do an aggregate analysis this block will eventually touch all the edges that's why we have a linear or v plus in time complex thing. dfs is a different way in this case i go deep as deep as possible in this direction and back up go as deep as possible in this direction back up back up and go deep here and go deep here and then go deep here. That is the idea. So if I start from this at time one, at time four I am here, three here, four here, then five, then six, then seven, then eight. So this is kind of this is like our pre-order traverse in a regular tree. Again, so just like I mentioned, first I do the root for the current mode, then I do extrapolation. So it's pre-order traverse. We can also implement it uh, iteratively using this stack. So let's let me trace that iteration with an example. I start with A. I put push my neighbors, unvisited neighbors, to the stack. So as so from A, I start. I select one of my neighbors arbitrary which is B, I push it to the stack, then from B, I continue, push C, then B, B is pushed, from B, I go to left for no reason, from E, D, I go to E, push, now, so the reason I push them to the stack is to backtrack, so this is something we have discussed in a previous lecture, backtracking, I will Backtrack my decision because I am stuck here from E. I cannot go any unvisited neighbor. So backtrack means kill, pop it off, and come back to the next recent one, which is D. So I am not here. I have a next availability, which is F. So push F into my world. Then I have no availability. So pop F, then pop D. D, so, but no, not to copy because when I am here, D leads me to another uh, hat starting with 8. So push 8. Now at 8, I am stuck. So pop 8 off, which is this. Then I am at D. I am stuck. Everyone around is visited. So 
remove the pop it's off and let's see everyone is visited pop c pop b now i am left with a but a has another connection to an unvisited part which is i so pop push i i is stuck everyone around is visited so pop it off and a pop it off and we are done so this is exactly this algorithm push s and if uh, uh, there is uh, an unvisited vertex reachable from uh, the uh, current element just push it to the stack and visit it and continue so some exercise follows it is the same idea bfs and bfs on a directed curve now but let me do the bfs so may i first do this point here and from b i can go to d on me but e be careful then from c i can go to d and f and also d so it is direct it is connected from d i can go a, and finally i go to it this is the bfs for instance so this picture here depicts a bfs right first right because it's starting from here it explores frontier by frontier it would have been bfs if i go as deep as possible like head to the toe here then back up so another uh, leg and back up and go here so this would be this would have been bfs uh, let's see algorithms other than traversals I will look into these three in detail later, but these ones they are also very popular, but we don't have enough time, so I will just skip them with one sentence. Network flow problems about constructing a flow of units with minimum cost, where there are edges, capacities at every edges, so you should respect those capacity. Uh, you shouldn't overflow. Minimum uh, spend three is the task of selecting the subset of edges that connects all the vertices with minimum cost. What is the short spot problem though? Uh, I want to go from one vertex uh, S so that that be the S and to every other vertex and I want to learn the paths, length of those paths. Also I want to learn the shortest paths. So basically it is an an application of red first sort, right because if it's undirected unweighted it means that every edge counts as one so what you can do is you can start and build your way in bfs manner so if i start from here so this is the cost this is the length from short to spread from v2 to v2 which is zero right it makes sense i am at v2 anyway then look at my neighbors in bfs manner so these are my neighbors then this is the shortest path from v2 to v5 and the cost is one then select this because this is the first thing before and then make this thing two and this thing two it is what one my current value plus one because of these weights two then in the next iteration then i will do this but this doesn't lead me to anywhere because it is stuck in the directions are into v5 not out of v5 so i think i started from here so this 2 plus 1 it makes length 3 and so the shortest path from v2 to v4 will have 3 edges which is this 1 2 3 and, or this is also 1 2 3 but i have already found one so when i come here tries to update this but it's already updated so uh, even if you update it you will get the same value but this will help me update this thing which is 3 so i noticed that this won't update it to 4 3 plus 1 because b4 thanks to bread first sort v3 will make the update here and so it is an application of bfs so if you look at the code we have the nq and the qs so this is exactly the bfs code
Weighted one is a more challenging problem, but it's more realistic. Uh, because, for instance, if you want to go from one city to another, so if these are my cities like Ankara, Istanbul, Lutra, etc., uh, then the weights will represent the length of the roads from uh, Ankara to Bursa, for instance. Right? So it shouldn't be one because Ankara to Bursa is different than Ankara to Istanbul. So, how do I solve this problem? Let me just go through the algorithm. Uh, so, just like before, uh, the values here inside the mouse will be my final answer. Okay. So, from S to S, the result is zero, trivially. All others, uh, so length of the shortest path from S to X is unknown, so just put an infinity here. I have weights here and I have a directed graph. So put everything into a priority queue, like a mini heap. Okay, we okay, have discussed heaps in a previous class. So I will use a priority queue here. Be careful, uh, DFS was handled with a regular queue. Okay, so when all of them are in the priority queue, and when I do look at the minimum, I will get this because this is zero, other side infinity. What you do is you relax uh, the environment as follows. From zero, I can go here and here. I can go here with the cost of 10. Zero plus 10 is 10. It is better than infinity, so keep it. Do the transition. Similarly, so 0 plus 5 is 5, better than infinity. Do the transition, so I do. So at this time, the shortest path from S to T has a length of 10. Turn into the situation, and the shaded edge means that this is the path. Go to T from S. It is basically the parent of T is S. It is telling you that. In the next iteration, so I pop it off. I, uh, deleted mean, I deleted this from my life, but in the current priority queue, I have 10, 5, infinite, infinite. The minimum is 5, so I will select it. This is selected in the next stage. So let's select it here. 5 plus 3 is better than 10. So something amazing happens here. 8 is better than 10. I update this, so let's go here. This is now 8. And be careful. The parent of t is not s anymore. The previous node of t is not s because I have come here from y. So that's why I shaded this edge. So I am keeping the path as well as this color value, which is 8. So at this iteration, I know that the shortest path from s to t has a cost of 8, not 10. And it is going like from s, y, t, not s, t. So this is done, uh, and by the way, others, so 5 plus 9 is better than this, so it becomes 14, um, and 5 plus 2 is better than it, so it updates to 7, and whenever I update it, I also update the previous of this node, because I came it from the current mean, which is y. In the next iteration, I have 8, 14, and 7 in my life, minimum 7, and select 7, 7 plus 6 is 13, better than 14, so make it 13 and shape this edge because it is the previous of x, which is z. Similarly, what has happened here? Uh, there is no more update here. Now 8 and 13, minimum is 8. So 8 plus 1 is 9, better than 13, so it will be 9. Let's go to this figure. Be careful. Uh, Previous of x was this edge, but when I do this update, I also update that edge to this edge. So at this time, I know the shortest path from s to x will follow this path, and its cost is 9. Uh, and finally, only one node in my heap uh, extracted uh, and make it black actually. Okay, it is done, and try to update your neighbors. And you can't, they have already finalized. So, 
Right. So the last step doesn't really do anything. If you implement what I just told you, if I implement it, this, this is just a different example. So this is the way we implement this. First, we add all the vertices to the queue. So build heap. We can do it in all the time, as you know. Then, until the queue is empty, I delete one. So, so I will move every vertex one by one. So there will be all the cost. I will set the minimum element. If I am using k min heap, it is log v complexity. But if I am using k array, what is the cost of finding minimum? It's all v time, not log v time. So there are trade-offs here. Then for each edge of the current vertex, and I look at neighborhood, I try to do this update. Uh, remember what was it about? It was look at your uh, Current value 8 plus the edge value 9. Is it better than 13? Yes, so update it. So this is what just happened here. Uh, uh, 8, your current value plus the edge value 9. 9 is better than 13, the existing value. So do the update. Uh, so the time context is this block is executed. Uh, over all edges in the end, not in the current iteration, but if you do the aggregate analysis, uh, you look at all these neighborhoods one by one, and in total, in the end, you will be doing this part three times. Okay, and within here, uh, what I'm doing once I update a current value, I also need to update my heap with a log v operation. So this block will cost me so it will go over e times in total and the log b update is because of heap so i will have e log v here and before that i have v log v here v is this v times the lead e log v okay so the worst case complexity if you use a prior to Q is this thing. This is not that bad because the number of edges is actually uh, uh, so if the graph is dense it will be V square because V choose to remember then so instead of this this part is more Powerful, so I will just keep e log v here. Uh, but the thing is, this can be as bad as v square log v if the graph is dense. Um, but it is not the usual case, usually, we do with sparse graphs. So, in that case, I will end up with a nice complexity, like in that case, e log v all v. So, complexity will be v log v. And even better, even better is this part. So, this log v, which is due to the Decrease key operation can be done in all one constant amortized, amortized time if you use a Fibonacci heap that we haven't discussed, but as an advanced topic, but this can go away, then you end up with this complex. And again, if E is OV, then your complex will be V log V, which is the general case. And if E is, if your graph is dense, then V square will dominate. However, I use a regular array, not the mean heap at all. Then what will happen is there will be minimum finding in v time. I will do it v v times. So that's why I will have all this square complexity. In the other side, there will be no decrease key because I will be using an array. So I am going to save you from that e log v cost. But still, I have this terrible v square if I'm using here. Okay, so that is that. Next application, topological sorting. So you have a directed acyclic graph, and I want to draw it on a line such that all the edges go from left to right. Okay. So I will show you why it is useful, but first let's understand it. It is not a regular sorting, it is that the arrows go from left to right. In other words, uh, if graph contains an edge uv, 
can do appears before we in the ordering. Okay, so if there is anything like this, then in the ordering, I should say you before we. Okay, so I should never. So maybe there is also an S for me to W. So it is okay, but if there is a cycle, then I cannot achieve topological sorting in the first place because there is no way to move everyone to right in this case. So that's why I will be dealing with a acyclic graph. So that is it saying it darkly. So it's an important direct acyclic graph. So, how do I, so one application of this is uh, this is about dependency resolving. So, the algorithm, let's go to an algorithm. Start with an arbitrary node, but for, first let me tell you the outcome here. So, this is the sorting. So, it says, it, notice that all the edges go from left to right, which is what I mean. So, it says that I can vary in this order. So, I start with a naked body after shower or something. I can first put on my socks uh, and then shoes. So, be careful. So, if I try to move socks here, then this edge, this edge, would look like this, right? Socks to shoes, so this is socks. And it is from right to left, for the grand. It isn't meaningful because you cannot first wear your shoes, then wear your socks, right? It is the idea of dependency resolving. So how do I achieve this graph then? Start with an arbitrary node and do a depth first search. This is the start time. I start from here 1, 2, 3. I can go as far as here. Here I cannot go anywhere else. So this finishes. This is the finish time 4. Then finish. Come back here. Finish. I can't do anything. Then I am here. Don't finish because I can go here. So time 6. Finish at 7. Come back and finish at 8. Then start with a random node like this 9 and finish at 10 because I am stuck. Then start with this random node vertex. At the next time it is 11, go here 12, go here 13, stop, finish 14, 15, 16, and then start from here 17 and then 18. Once you have the finish times, look only at the finish times, okay? The descending order this the sorting of the finish times will give you the topological sorting so the bfs takes linear time as we know uh, and then if you do a normal sorting it would take v log v time like quick sort not sort you sort uh, but you can do even better you can keep everything in v how do i do it don't wait until the last minute to sort uh, use a linked list insert the item to the front of the linked list as you finish it so in this case I first finished the jacket right so first inserted it to the beginning of the linked list this is the only element in my linked list now then I finish it finish time so insert it to the front of the linked list so be careful this is the head of the linked list then <coughs> what has happened then belt finished Insert it to the front of the linked list, and as you know, insertion to the front of the linked list is a constant time operation all along, so it doesn't really hurt you. Uh, all the complexity here is all the. Yeah, this what I just discussed. And by the way, starting from short is totally arbitrary because I'm not using the start times in my result, I am using the finish times. So it, it, it would have been the same if I have started with this node, for instance. You can do it as a practice. So you will end up, you, if you start from here, you will not end up with this sorting, but you will end up with a different topological sorting. So there are many answers, but it will be still valid. So, for instance, if you start with what time one, it will finish at time two, right? So, what will be at the very end, so you can drag this thing to here, it doesn't really matter, you can also drag it and then put it here, or I don't know, you can put socks between under shorts and habits, 
in a different topology so I think which is still valid because I can first layer my box here and then socks and then press it's okay so we have seen one application like uh, dependency solving another dependency solving is on the compiler uh, design which is a more related topic than wearing some clothes so to build a DNL A you must have built VCD first because maybe that A is making references to memory to objects in VCD so then you put all these dependency edges and make a topological sorting so it tells you to first do B, C and B in some order I don't know and then do B right, so this is the uh, yeah, so this I think this is the last uh, example, last idea that can be done with the graph. Uh, so the problem here is assign colors to vertices such that neighbor vertices have different colors. It is called graph coloring. So in this case, this is blue. This cannot be blue because they are neighbors with an edge, not with a pet with an edge. Uh, so you need to put different co colors okay. and you need to do it for all the vertices so it's a difficult problem uh, and you need to use smallest number of colors that's a little tricky actually if you have n vertices you can use n colors right then all of them will be different will be obeying your rule trivially but it is expensive we will do it with as small colors as possible and I care about it because it helps me handle many many scheduling problems or conflict resolution conflict resolution is whatever so let's go to examples I have a series of taxi journeys reserved in advance I know the start time and end time okay so this is called an interval graph representing that so first journey will take this much time second is a shorter journey the third one is this it starts at this time maybe it is uh, the job finishes at this time we close the cap at this time etc so i have 10 journeys here obviously 10 taxis they will be sufficient but it is expensive i will hire only three taxis so where did this number come from it came from solving graph coloring problem so i will model this problem as a graph uh, problem so in the beginning in the very beginning i told you that many computer science problems can be represented as graphs so i will represent this problem as a graph be careful how do i do it uh, every journey i have 10 of them is a vertex so i have 10 nodes here 1 2 3 4 5 6 10 uh, if their times overlap like 2 and 3 they overlap so i put an edge between 2 and 3 Okay, so 1 and 10 doesn't overlap, so there is no edge from 1 to 10. Now you color it with the algorithm that I will show you later. Uh, with as few colors as possible, 3. Then use only 3 taxes. So, I don't color it to yellow, because then these two journeys try to, are tried to be done with the yellow taxi, which is not possible. So, yellow and blue then another color maybe so in the end once you solve this problem you will tell your boss that i will need three taxis the first one will serve journey one five eight ten etc the same problem maybe it's even more uh, common you are handling an airport you have a series of flights with a start and end time and you need to reserve gates to them if you have ten airplanes you can reserve 10 gates but i can do only three you know so i will do minimal number of gates for these three flights just the same idea as before i will keep the names as taxi here you can also resolve radio station frequency complex uh, this right another problem schedule exams so you will do final exams for instance uh, two courses clash if some student taking them both 
for the same person cannot be the two, at the two exams at the same time. So they clash. Uh, if you have nine classes, then nine times less obviously enough, but I will do only four times less and there are four, four classrooms. Uh, how do I do it? Every vertex is a graph, there is a vert every course is a vertex in my graph. So for instance, fourth V4 is about this lecture, which is a very important lecture in my opinion, but I currently it is here, so it is connected to one, two, three, seven other class uh, courses, seven other nodes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you build a graph like this, uh, and then you run your graph coloring algorithm here, and for every color you reserve a different zone. So in the blue uh, uh, room, you can handle algorithms and friends like your class. For so, so let your A, which is algorithms, and let your four, which is front letter. You can do it because um, there is no conflict there. Actually, there is some um, this table is for arbitrary, I guess, but we get the idea. Right? So, we look to a graph like this, uh, <coughs> and if there is a clash, put an edge, so that edge will give those two uh, courses different colors, hence different time slots. That's in another uh, conflict resolution, you are managing a zoo, you need separate cages because some species do not get along well. So your enemies are your vertices, and if two enemies are hating each other, like I don't know, bird and cat, uh, and there is an edge, so you will put bird and cat to different cages because they will have different colors, and this algorithm will give you the minimal number of cages. Another related problem: spreading seeds arrangement. Some people do not want to sit together because of some drama. Uh, if you have nine people here, okay, so nine parties, sorry. Okay, so one party is this consisting of four guys, the second party is consisting of um, two, uh, four people, etc. So apparently, if you put a vertex for every party, so there will be nine vertices, and if you put a match between two vertices, if there is a hating situation, drama, then you will put them into different tables like yellow table and blue table. So I found a website called Ready Sea Planner or something. So it is this is really an issue apparently. You can solve pseudo. How do I solve pseudo? So I will represent pseudo problem as a graph problem. Okay. So let's go with this example. Okay. Uh, so Sudoku is about this, right? Fill in the blanks such that each row, each row, each column, and each two by two block has the numbers from one to four on the ones. There is no duplication. So what I do is, I have in in, in this case, I I will fill two by two blocks. So I will have a four by four. And grids globally, so 16 uh, slots, 16 positions. So every position will be a vertex in my graph. Okay. Uh, then, so this will be the red. Red is uh, one. Okay. Whenever you see red, you get to turn one. So this one. Uh, is connected to the so in this row there will, there can be only one net because it's the same row, the number of definition so I connect it to the second so let's go over the existing edges second third and fourth 
because of the row constraint. Because of the column constraint, I will connect this vertex to the 5th, 9th and 13th entry. That was the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 11, 12, 13. So this is connected to 13 on the row like this. See the edge. And this is connected to 9 like this. There is then I can just overlay it. There is also this issue cannot be disconnected to 1, 2, 5 and 6. So it's connected to 5 and 6. So what has happened here? If I put a red here, other endpoints cannot be red. Which makes total sense because red, uh, in the red regions I will put the number 1. I have only 4 colors and 4 numbers. 1 is for red or red is for 1. So when you solve this problem, you will be solving the pseudocode. And sometimes you begin your pseudocode with some clues, uh, some cells are already filled, then you can just color those vertices in advance. Another application of graph coloring, I can color maps uh, uh, to separate them robustly. For instance, this is a map of England, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I can represent this as a graph where every city is a vertex and if there is a if they are neighbors then there I put an edge between those two vertices so that edge is the second. Then run a graph coloring algorithm uh, and uh, you, uh, you can color this graph with uh, so it depends on the algorithm you run. So if I run a suboptimal algorithm, you will be using five colors, but in theory, only four colors should be sufficient. It is proven, but it has been proven with computer. It's by exhausting the all kind of all cases. So that's why it's a controversial proof. But there is a relaxed theorem like six color. It says that six color is enough to paint uh, to color a map uh, properly in such a way that no two neighbors have the same color. So this is a relaxed version because obviously since 4 is already proven, 6 is obviously true, but uh, the proof of this is easier so I can give it to you in one minute if you want. Uh, but before that we need to believe in other theorems like this, that's why it is slightly coming out of topic here, so I will set uh, this actually. Uh, but it makes sense. So let's let not skip it, you can skip it here, but I will uh, just give you this proof. There's a nice application of induction. So every planar graph, this is a planar graph, uh, have a vertex of degree 5 or less. So this is given, you should believe me about that. So, Call that vertex V, okay, so this is that vertex, okay, it has a degree, means, means that it is connected to 5 vertices, 5 or less, but let's go with the worst case, 5. So, remove it, okay, now I have a subgraph, and by induction, this graph can be colored with 6 colors, because it is how induction works, it's, you can assume that it works for the smaller problem. Now, add this back to my life, and be careful, I have in the worst case, um, so this can be colored with six colors. In the worst case, they will all have different colors. So in a better case, they will have the same color. So this is red, this can also be red, right? Because maybe there is no connection from here to here. But in the worst case, let's assume that these are also connected. So I have five colors, and, but I already have the sixth color in my hand, so we use the sixth color. This is how you prove it actually. Another cool thing you can solve with graph coloring is a new uh, art gallery problem. What is it? You need to hire stationary uh, guards to protect the gallery. So you have the floor plan, bird eye view, this is a polygon. Um, and uh, so a guard has 360 view, so it basically views this point if the line. This stays within this polygon, so it is, I think, clear. 
So graph coloring helps us to prove that at most n in all the three bars are enough. So obviously if you have n vertices, um, you can put graphs to every vertex and it is covered, right? It is not efficient. You can do with n over three parts uh, to cover an n vertex polygon. So to be able to prove it, uh, you need to, I need to show you, I need to give you again two different theorems. So the first one is number of triangles in any triangulation is n minus two. These are all proven in my uh, other graphics class, seven, eight, nine. Geometry processing, but for now, let's only believe that an n vertex polygon has n minus two triangles. So, in this case, these are the triangles of my polygon. I have triangulated it, and any triangulation is three colorable. So, I can even quickly prove this just remove one ear, like there is this portion of ear, it's uh, ear triangle. So by induction the remaining can be three colored and now add this triangle back this will be neighboring to these two colors so use the third armless color this is what I mean. now let me give you the actually n over three upper bounds using graph coloring so there are n vertices and from n vertices the least frequently used color appears at n over 3 times. Why? So that's, this is a very nice argument. If you have uh, um, uh, so I, have, I can decompose my n into sum of 3 n over 3 times. So now the least frequent color appears and over three times. But what happens if I decrease this number? So if I increase this number for this one, the least frequent, so it becomes like more. But then to compensate for that action, because it needs to add up to n, it will automatically decrease. So in that case, this will be the least frequent uh, value, the minimum value, which is at most n over 2. So I think you buy this argument. It is due to Peter Norton as well. Also. So now, what I will tell you is this observation. Since every triangle, so I have n minus 2 triangles here, I can put a guard inside of every triangle. It will guard this triangle, right? Because it's a convex thing, it can see everywhere, no matter how weird your triangle is. But instead of here, I will put the guards to the least. To the vertices, and I will select the least frequent uh, color vertex because I want this minimum cost. I just showed you that three colors are enough, and when you put the guard here, every triangle in the end will be colored because since every triangle has one vertex of this color, if you look at here, every triangle will have a vertex of color red. I think red is the least frequent one here, it doesn't really matter. Since every triangle has one vertex of this color and this card covers the triangle, all the color is covered. If I had however used four colors, which is not the case, but if I had used four colors, then a triangle which has three vertex might be missing one that least frequent color, right? Uh, but luckily it is not the case because I have just proved that three coloring is enough so I can guard all the polygon on the floor with n over three parts it is amazing and so how to solve the problem finally a couple of slides then I have to leave you uh, so the exact solution is I have k colors uh, so for every vertex I can have k possibilities or the other k other case or product group, I have k to the n possibilities. Create all of them one by one and then check whether it is legal or not. Legal means to vertices if they are connected, color must have been different. But this is an exponential algorithm, right? K 
gave the power of him by his terrible end. Exponential algorithms are really bad, they should be avoided because your problem size is 10, for instance, and you make it 100, like increase it 10 times. The linear time algorithm will do uh, 100 minutes, 100 steps, even in that configuration, and if I increase it 10 times. But this exponential algorithm will not do 100 steps, it will do uh, infinite, not infinite, but an enormously large number of steps, so it grows very quickly. So we should avoid exponential algorithms. Uh, we will have some heuristics uh, before applying that I can use some machine learning as well because some heuristics are good for some graphs so I will train a neural network for instance uh, like that I will I have one graph and apparently second heuristic is good on that and for the input graph T7 for instance heuristic 1 is good uh, similarly, for another graph, another heuristic is good. So, with that idea, given a query graph, we, we decide the best heuristic for that one, and then apply that heuristic. So, we we are doing a graph classification in some sense, uh, and to classify graphs, uh, we need to extract some features out of them, uh, such as number of nodes, number of edges, density of edges, uh, node degree, minimum degree, max degree, mean degree, etc. So that graph feature versus the preferred heuristic on that graph. That graph, that heuristic, that graph, that heuristic. These, these pairs will be trained in a, uh, will be trained uh, and our neural network weights will get ready uh, and then when the unobserved new graph comes we will recommend a particular heuristic so this is one way to go uh, and by the way to measure heuristic performance you can run both heuristics on every training graph and pick the one with that uses the fewest colors or that takes the least amount of time so let's talk about heuristics and then finish our discussion today first heuristic is the one that um, orders vertices arbitrarily and then we have and colors hopefully you will not be using all of them uh, and then the algorithm is uh, for i want to n uh, color vi with the lowest legal color cj so i will make this algorithm clear in a second but before let's analyze the complexity what we are doing it here is uh, for the first vertex i look at all the colors in the worst case n colors second vertex i look at all the n colors so i have n square complexity and to make still uh, this is an arbitrary ordering one ordering to make it optimal i need to look at all n factorial orderings and uh, select the fewest color out of that brute force search uh, so n factorial is unacceptable in our world for even low number of n's uh, so we will not do the optimal solution here but it can be done uh, but we won't do it so with so how does the algorithm go let's talk about that basically uh, so let's go over an example I pick a particular ordering okay this is totally arbitrary so for v1 select the low so this is color id1 c1 C2 is orange, C3 is yellow, C4 is green, etc. For V1, C1 is okay, so I make it red. Then the order says V7, so go to V7. I cannot do it red because of the connectivity to a red guy. So the next lowest legal color is C2. Then the next color is V3. V3 is incident to red, C1 and C2, so do C3 here, which is yellow. Then the next is V4, similarly yellow goes there. Then the next is V2, V2 is in adjacent to red, C1, mm. but uh, no one else uh, currently, 
so I can make it uh, orange which is see through so that is the way we go and uh, in the end for instance let's come to the last situation we ate to decide its its color c1 c3 and c2 they are all used so I need to go to c4 hence I use four colors in this example which is not optimal because the optimal uh, number would have been three uh, for some graphs, regardless of the ordering, you will end up with the perfect optimal uh, result, uh, even with this uh, one for loop. So, for any ordering, so it can be a star graph like this. So, if you start from here, make it red, and the other, and any order you pick, they, you will always select blue. So, two color red and blue, or start from here, make it red, then. You go here red, go here red, and when you come here, eventually you will make it blue. So order doesn't really matter. Similarly for this complete bipartite graph, you will always get the optimal value of two. But for other graphs, maybe, maybe take this example. I can do a very good ordering and find the optimal value of two. So in this case, the ordering would have been first go from up top to the top to bottom on the left so go red 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 they are not connected so red is okay then order continues from top to down top to bottom on the right hand side you cannot do it red because it's connected to a red green and then all green so in this case two colors so that ordering would make this algorithm work very fine but in the same graph, this zigzagging ordering would lead to a, a catastrophic result. So I will make it red, and I will go here, I will go zigzags, remember. I can still do it red, because it, they, there weren't any actually, remember. Don't worry about my red line here. So red, red. When I come back here in my zigzagging spirit, I cannot do it red, do it green. The same logic. This would be green because it is not connected, but it is red. And in the next time, I need to select blue because it is connected to green and this is connected to red, etc. So you have n vertices, and every two of them make one row, and every row has a different color, so n over 2 is terrible. But there is some good news. I can still make a theoretical upper bound on this algorithm, which is d plus 1, if the next degree is d. So how does it work? For a one vertex graph, this obviously works because in that graph, it is only one node. Degree is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1. I need only one color, which is red, whatever. For the general case, take a graph with vertices we want to win. Okay? Remove one vertex, just let's remove again, okay? So this vertex can be the one that has the max degree D or cannot be that one. So in either case, the in the end the red subgraph here has n minus one vertices and the max degree will be D or less. It can be D. Uh, when does it come D? Uh, when, for instance, V3 has that max degree, and I remove Vn, so I still have D in my life. So then, that subgraph has max degree D. But maybe Vn had that D degree, and I removed it, then it doesn't have that degree here. That is the logic. But in either case, I have n minus 1, but this is a smaller graph where induction can apply. So by inductive hypothesis, this subgraph needs an upper bound of d plus one colors. It is coming from the statement. Uh, okay, d plus one color. I colored it. Now I need to add vn back. So even if all the neighbors of, and by the way, how many neighbors can we have at most? At most d, because in the initial graph, d was the number. I cannot go above it. So even if all these D neighbors have different colors, which can happen. But I still have one little color left to make this D, this new vertex we can connect to this D guys, and that is the D plus one color.
So that is the proof. And let's uh, do the second heuristic, which is totally irrelevant. So it behaves better than heuristic one. Still no optimal guarantee, optimality guarantee. In this case, choose the uncolored vertex with the highest number of different neighbor colors and color it legally. So initially, everyone is uncolored, so select the highest degree, which is this. This is also highest, but arbitrarily I go with this red. With that. In the next iteration, uh, so this vertex has one different neighbor color red. This has one, this has one, this has one. And out of them, select one with the highest degree, which is this. It has a degree of four. I cannot do it red because of that, so do it orange. Let's do one more iteration in which, uh, so this guy has two different colors, this guy has two different colors, so these are my candles, this guy has only one different color. So out of them select this three yellow and continue. So yeah, actually it has, uh, it finishes, it concludes our class. So I have shown you heuristic two, second heuristic, as well as the first one. And also, more importantly, I have discussed all other things on graphs, and I hope they have all landed. And so, thanks.